initiating this this process with the International Criminal Court and characterizing it as a crime against humanity is fundamentally important in order to get um, answers. A group of lawyers wants to drag Canada before an international court because of the Kamloops residential school discoveries. The children buried at these sites must have their identities restored and their stories told. The site of a former residential school in Brandon, Manitoba could be another place where children are buried. If a mother receives the vaccine, uh, there will be antibodies in the breast milk. And the Nunavut Health Department says that will help protect babies from COVID-19. Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The Sioux Valley Dakota Nation in Manitoba is working to identify students buried at the Brandon Indian Residential School. And they're partnering with researchers from across the country to conduct that investigation. With more, here's Daryl Stranger. No one really knows how many children are buried at the Brandon Residential School, which operated from 1895 to 1972. Through research and interviews, the team of university researchers, along with the Sioux Valley Dakota Nation, hope to identify the children and work with their families and communities. The families and communities whose children were lost while attending these schools have questions that deserve answers. The children buried at these sites must have their identities restored and their stories told. They will never be forgotten. Every child matters. Chief Bone said they have identified a number of potential graves so far. While employing archaeological survey techniques, geophysical technologies, survivor accounts and archival documents, our investigation has identified 104 potential graves in all three cemeteries and that only 78 are accountable through cemetery and burial records. Investigations into the cemeteries and unmarked graves at the school began in 2012. The project received funding seven years later, but that work was interrupted by the pandemic. Project lead Eldon Yellowhorn is an archaeologist and professor of Indigenous Studies at Simon Fraser University. He hopes this work will bring closure to the families. In instances where you know, they might be one or two generations removed from these individuals, uh, you know, like if, if that person had grown up and become somebody's uncle, you know, that, that they'll never know that. So this is one way for them to uh, bring some closure for their families and their communities. Forensic methods like radar and drone survey are being deployed. Yellowhorn believes this project can be an example for other communities who want to undertake similar projects. It's very important for our communities to have some control over uh, our, our lives and our histories. Ultimately, you know, like what I would like to show is that we are, we're the ones who are capable of doing this, you know. Uh, we don't have to wait for experts to come from any other community. We can be the experts, you know. There is no timeline for when the work might be completed, mostly due to the pandemic. Daryl Stranger, APT National News, Winnipeg. Meanwhile, more than a dozen lawyers from across the country have filed a request pro bono to the International Criminal Court, requesting that those involved in the Kamloops Indian Residential School be investigated. APTN's Tamara Pimentel spoke with some of those lawyers in Alberta. It is a subject that is near to my heart. My mom having attended one of these schools, the fallout from her attendance of that school, the, the impact it had on her and, and on the rest of the family. Andrew Fipers is one of 15 lawyers calling on the International Criminal Court to investigate Canada and the Vatican for crimes against humanity following the discovery of 215 graves at the Kamloops Indian Residential School. He's based out of Red Deer, Alberta, but as a member of the Tanaha First Nation in BC, Fiper says some members of his community also attended this institution. To me, uh, initiating this, this process with the International Criminal Court and characterizing it as a crime against humanity is, is fundamentally important in order to get um, answers. And he says an international court is the only way to get those answers. The fact is, is that the government of Canada, including the RCMP, 
and including the Vatican, including the churches, all have a vested interest in the truth not coming out. Calgary-based lawyer Brendan Miller said the investigation could lead to the prosecution of the Catholic Church, the Government of Canada, and any living member that took part in the residential school. We have to remember that continuing to suppress and cover up a crime against humanity is a crime against humanity itself. And it is a prosecutorially uh, a prosecutable offence, both domestically under Canada's Crimes Against Humanity and War Crimes Act and at international law under the Rome Statute. Right now, the longer that this information and documents and evidence continues to be suppressed and covered up by the government, they are committing a crime against humanity. On June 7th, the International Criminal Court System wrote a response stating it has opened a file to determine whether or not the investigation will go through. It's frankly an absolute embarrassment uh, to this country that Canada, who is one of the founding members of the UN, one of the founding members of the Rome Statute creating the International Criminal Court, one of the purported great human rights advocates and supporters of the United Nations internationally, has failed miserably in dealing with this massive crime against humanity. Tamara Pimentel, APTN National News, Calgary. And UN independent experts urged Canada and the Catholic Church to, quote, conduct, prompt, uh, conduct a prompt and thorough investigation. Well, yesterday we ran an interview with the Archbishop of Vancouver, who's going much further than the Pope in taking responsibility for the graves discovered at the Kamloops Residential School. Now here is APTN video journalist Tina House with part two of her interview with Archbishop Michael Miller. In your opinion, how could these former nuns and priests and workers at these schools conduct themselves in this way? I mean, this was like right, horrific. Right to me, and that is a bit of a mystery, and I, I don't know. I, I, all I can say is that what they did was very wrong. I, there's no, there's no defense for such actions, and um, yeah, I, it's sort of in that way. All evil is in a way mysterious. You know why? There's a, a Latin phrase, the mysterium iniquitatis, the mystery of iniquity. Why do people do wicked things? In a way, evil is inexplicable. I mean, it's real. We have to acknowledge it. And people are responsible. But going beyond that into their own pasts or their own histories, I'm, I don't know. I imagine it varies from perpetrator to perpetrator. You mentioned that, you know, the pain of, of the victims in this case. I mean, we're talking about survivors that have just really been suffering for so many years, right. uh, relying sometimes on drugs and alcohol to bury those feelings, feelings down of guilt, deep. Right, of, of Would horror. the church consider a fund to help support more treatment centers and healing opportunities well, for those? Well, you know, during the, the settlement, we did do that. And I think one of the things that um, in this particular um, instance for, for the Kamloops situation that uh, the Archdiocese has pledged, maybe not to build a center, but certainly to provide um, uh, or pay for, because we can't provide it, for counseling for family members who lost a child, you know, if they needed some mental health support, some counseling support, that we would certainly be, be willing, to, not willing, we should do that. So I guess we'd be willing to do it because we should. Cookby, Casimir, and others have, have asked for the church to return the school records. They yes. need those records to right. help identify those little ones that we right. found and potentially more burial sites like this right. on every other you right. know, residential school across Canada. Why is it the church is hesitant, do you think, to return these records? I can't speak, I can speak that we've handed over all our records that we have here. And I know that for the, in the case of the Kamloops School, that the um, Sisters of St. Anne and the Oblates of Mary Immaculate are willing to be transparent. There are some details, and I'm not sure of them, of some records that 
because there might be some privacy. I don't know the details, but I know that they want to. And I certainly um, think that every, that every record that we have should be made available. I think, you know, full transparency is the only way to regain a lost trust. The news of the finding of these young children has sent shockwaves around the world. It has. You know, people Beyond are Canada. just, are they're speechless that this could go on basically without being known for so long, yet the survivors told these stories for many, many years. Yeah, and I think this might not be the last tragedy that becomes unveiled of the past. Um, I think we have to, I, I'd be very, I'd never say, well, this is the last time we'll, I, I'd probably not. And so each time is a time to, time to mourn and to recommit, you know, that, 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 that's the way I see it. And the final part of this interview will air right here on tomorrow night's newscast. Time for a quick break, but when we return, we're going to take a deeper look at the life of Joyce Eshevorn. Welcome back. The world was introduced to Joyce Eshaquan in late September 2020 after she live streamed her dying moments to Facebook. But dozens of other videos published on social media provide an intimate inside look at her life. So with exclusive permission from the Eshaquan family, Lindsay Richardson brings us Joyce in a completely new way. If a picture's worth a thousand words, what about video? Joyce Eshaquan filmed everything. The important things. Memories to be cherished forever. Others, not so much. An 18th birthday. Her family. Her children. And her husband, Carol, <laughs> who always made her laugh. <laughs> the Eshaquan family's lawyer granted APTN exclusive access to these videos to remind the public of Joyce's life before her live video taken last September 28th, before everything changed. <laughs> <laughs> aux conjoints, aux parents, aux enfants, amis de Joyce et à la communauté, merci pour votre courage, merci pour votre résilience, votre force. The coroner's inquest examining Joyce's death officially ended just over a week ago. Experts went on record saying it was preventable, that Joyce was a casualty of the flawed environment at Joliet Hospital. The video in which she live-streamed her last moments drew international outrage. But in court testimony, she was labeled narcotic dependent, an aggressive woman in poor health who struggled with mental illness. This is not the woman her family knew. Even Joyce's young son, too shy to speak in this 2018 video, couldn't stay quiet after losing his mom. À vos enfants, Monsieur Dubé, il faudra leur raconter que la petite révolution de la réconciliation a débuté grâce à leur maman. Except standing up takes its toll. Joyce's eldest daughter received death threats after testifying. And while bodyguards were hired to protect hospital workers during the inquest, the Eshaquan family received no support. <laughs> this is why thousands of people came from all over Quebec to march at the end of the inquest. The fear is still very real. Quand je regarde ce qui est, ce qui est arrivé, ça me fait vraiment mal. J'ai peur pour ces enf les, nos enfants, j'ai peur pour mes petits enfants, j'ai peur pour tout. Tantôt on est rentré dans un restaurant avec ma fille. Là, là. 
Ils nous regardaient comme si on était des, des, des criminels, parce qu'on était habillés comme ça. Puis je demande que le gouvernement reconnaisse qu'il existe le racisme systémique partout, autant, autant chez, chez les hôpitaux, mais dans le système des hôpitaux, puis les centres jeunesse également aussi chez nos jeunes. Uh, partout, partout. Quebec insists it's addressing the issue in stages, but they're not bowing to pressure from the United Nations to adopt Joyce's principle, the health plan named for the mother of seven. L'Assemblée nationale adhère au principe de Joyce. Greg Kelly, a Liberal Party MNA, pushed for the principle several times, always with the same result. Y a-t-il consentement pour débattre de cette motion? Pas de consentement, M. le Président. Pas de consentement. But I'm just still a little bit, you know, uh, bewildered by how hard-headed the government is on this. The government always says, well, we want to do things in collaboration with you, and we want to work with you. So then after the Antique Regulation does their own consultation, they come up with recommendations on how Quebec can fix their health care system. The government says, well, thank you. You know, we acknowledge the, you know, tabling of this report, but we're going to do it our own way anyway. So... Uh, again, I think it's just old attitudes uh, coming to the surface that the government knows best and, and they'll fix the problems. But again, thank you very much for your con contribution to the discussions. There is no date set for the release of the Quebec coroner's report. And while politicians may be stalling, there's movement elsewhere. Donations to the family's fundraiser are spiking. A Justice for Joyce petition has hundreds of new signatures. The media cyclone is winding down. But Carole Dubé says he's still not ready to talk about Joyce, although she's always on his mind. He's been writing about her, and we have the family's permission to share this, too. You were the first to tell me I was handsome, my best partner. We did everything together. You are who you were, smiling, beautiful. Will there be a day or a night, a moment to see you? Why is it in my dreams I can? Why not everywhere? I'll be forever yours, Joyce. You're already waiting for me. Lindsay Richardson, APTN National News, Montreal. Heartbreaking stuff. An important look at Joyce and her family, though. To the pandemic now and Nunavut had one additional COVID-19 case to report today bringing the total to two cases both in Iqaluit. Nunavut has Canada's fastest growing and youngest population. Today the health department answered a question that applies directly to those infants and mothers. Can breastfeeding mothers who are vaccinated pass antibodies to their infants? What we know is that if you receive the vaccine, if a, if a mother receives the vaccine, uh, there will be antibodies in the breast milk uh, and that will be transferred to the baby and does provide some protect, probably provide some protection. The Siksika Nation in southern Alberta is operating a mobile immunization clinic to provide COVID vaccines to Calgary's most vulnerable. Siksika Health says the goal is to vaccinate as many marginalized people as possible, including Indigenous people living on and off reserve and those who are homeless. Dr. Sal Samanani with Siksika Health Services says it creates a safe place for those who don't trust the current health care system. Let's help the system and, and support it and participate by reaching those pockets that, again, um, have reasons, many reasons, systemic racism and other, to not, uh, not trust the mainstream services. And in Manitoba, getting your vaccine could really pay off. The province has announced the new vaccine lottery in an effort to encourage people to get immunized. The move comes after the Premier announced new immunization cards for people who have received both doses. Brian Pallister has announced nearly $2 million in cash prizes and scholarships to encourage Manitobans to get fully vaccinated. Two lottery draws will be held over the summer with cash prizes of $100,000 handed out. There will also be 10 draws for $25,000 scholarships for young people aged 12 to 17 across the province who have been vaccinated. All people who have been immunized with either a first or second dose are automatically eligible 
and will be entered into the lottery for a chance to win. Coming up, some stunning visuals of the solar eclipse. Stay with us. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. In memory of 215 children, these little bears were placed along a long fence boarding the Stony Nakoda First Nation between Calgary and Banff, Alberta. And you can keep your photos coming by sending them to share at aptn.ca and tune in tomorrow for our next photo of the day. Time now for a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, 12 with showers for St. John's and Charlottetown. Two and cloudy in Inukshuak, eight for Kujuak. 25 in Montreal, 18 in Shibugamu. 21 with showers for Sault Ste. Marie, sunny and 24 in North Bay. 21 with rain for Thunder Bay and Sioux Lookout. 20 with showers for God's Lake and Norway House. Rain and 23 for Winnipeg and Gimli. Showers and 20 for Regina and Saskatoon. 18 in Meadow Lake with rain, 17 in Buffalo Narrows with showers. In Northern Alberta, 21 with rain for Fort McMurray, partly cloudy and 20 in Grand Prairie. Sun's out and 20 for Edmonton, 18 under sunny skies in Lethbridge. Showers and 18 for Vancouver, 21 and cloudy for Kamloops. 14 with rain in Deese Lake, rain and 16 in Prince George. 22 in Old Crow, 24 in Dawson. 19 with rain in Yellowknife, 20 with showers for Wrigley. Sun's out, 9 for Saks Harbor, 12 in Politak. 8 in Chesterfield, 10 for Whale Cove. 0 with snow in Resolute, plus 4 in Joe Haven. Well, did you get up at the crack of dawn to see the solar eclipse this morning? If you're like me and did not, you're in luck. We have some visuals here for you. Our freelance videographer, Steve Monjo captured the solar eclipse this morning over the Toronto skyline. Steve walked a kilometer and a half with all of his gear to the escarpment in the Mount Nemo con conservation area to the west of the city. And he sped up this footage eight times in order to capture the event. The so-called Ring of Fire Eclipse was visible from many regions all around the world. It looks like Steve had a pretty fantastic vantage point in southern Ontario. A Dene musician has had much to celebrate this week after winning the Juno for Indigenous Artist of the Year. Leela Gilday's fifth album, North Star Calling, took the prize over the weekend. It's the second Juno win for the Northwest Territories artist. She won one in 2007. It's also her second win this year. She won Indigenous Songwriter of the Year at the Canadian Folk Awards back in April. Congrats to Leela. You can find more on Leela and anything else you've seen here over on our website, aptnnews.ca. That's all the time we have for this Thursday. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.